saints, peace, grace, love of Christ Jesus be with all of you. In our last study, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Specifically, we looked at the meaning of the word unrighteous. And through right division, we discovered what Paul meant when he said, the unrighteous would not inherit the kingdom of God. And we looked at the overall lifestyles of those that lived within the city of Corinth back then and the problems that the believers were having because of all this debauchery surrounding that city. Well, today our study is going to be focused primarily on the book of Romans, specifically the 10th chapter, 9, 10, and 11. And the objective of this study is to answer the following question. Can you become a member of the body of Christ today by using the ABC's method of salvation? Now, what is the ABC's method, you might be thinking? Well, A stands for admit you're a sinner. B stands for believe in Jesus. C stands for call on the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. In Romans 10, 13, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But hold on a second. That's not what Jesus says in Matthew 7. There seems to be a contradiction here. In Matthew 7, verse 21, it says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So there seems to be a contradiction between Romans chapter 10 and Matthew 7. Romans says whoever whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and the other says that some people who call on Jesus will not be saved so which one is it like so many other passages in scripture there sometimes seems to be a contradiction there is a seeming contradiction and in order to figure out why there's an apparent contradiction we need to rightly divide in order to figure out what's going on so the question is can people get saved today by using this ABC formula now what we need to do instead of asking for opinions is actually go to God's Word and see what he has to say about these things what his word says is the only thing that matters because it's his word and not man's word God is perfect man is not now, this ABC formula has been created by using scriptures in the, books, uh, in the book of Romans. Like we said, specifically Romans 10. Now, keep in mind, our objective here is we need to determine who's speaking, who's being spoken to, what's being spoken about, and what period of time this is taking place in. The right division questions of who, what, where, when, how, and why. And for the sake of right division, let's do a basic overview of the book of Romans real quick to get the context of what's going on. Now, in keeping of Paul's style, he opens the letter with his name. In fact, Paul opens with his name in every one of his books, Romans through Philemon, 13 books. It's Paul's watermark, if you will. Also, it's important to note that when, when Romans was written, Paul had never been to Rome. He's addressing Rome before ever going to Rome. So he's addressing the Roman assemblies that existed at that time and he's going to cover several different topics about several different groups of people. Paul talks about unbelievers, he talks about Gentiles, he talks about the Jews, he talks about believing Gentiles and Jews, and he also talks about unbelieving Jews that were still practicing the law even Jews who were believers but were still wrapped up in practicing the law at the same time. So Paul's writing to the Romans before ever going to Rome. It's also important to understand that Paul has been very, very active in the ministry prior to writing this letter or even heading to Rome. 
The letter to Rome is an overview of his ministry for the past decades. Literally decades of his ministry had transpired before Paul ever arrived in Rome. Now, if you remember how Paul came to know Jesus Christ, he's on his way to Damascus. And Paul at this time was against Jesus. He was against everyone who believed in Jesus. And he's on his way to Damascus to find believers. Okay, And, he, and he's on his way to, to arrest them and have them brought back to Jerusalem to be imprisoned and even killed for believing in Jesus Christ. Paul hated Jesus and everyone associated with Jesus. The story goes, as we know, Paul is on his way to Damascus. Jesus stops him, talks to Paul, blinds him, and Paul's led into Damascus shocked and blinded. Now the Lord speaks to a Jewish brother, Ananias, in a vision telling him to go find Paul to heal his eyes and to confirm what Paul had been seeing in his prayers and also uh, you know concerning the Savior Jesus so Paul becomes a believer he's baptized and he's sealed with the Holy Spirit then Paul travels to Arabia and the Bible doesn't say much about what happens in Arabia but I'm sure this is where Jesus confirmed many things for Paul even showing him part of the mystery of the gospel of grace now there's no doubt that Jesus told Paul to go to the Jews first then he would be sent to the Gentiles. This is part of the mystery that he, that was revealed. Now, what I want you to take note here of is that the timing of this. We're talking about approximately 35 AD, right? When Paul gets saved, if you will. Paul didn't go on any missionary journeys until around 48 AD. Now, notice there's 12 years after his confrontation with Jesus on the way to Damascus. So 12 years went by before Paul went on his first missionary journey. So Paul's first missionary journey is in 48 AD. His second journey is around 51 AD and his third journey is right around 54 AD. So from 52 to 58 AD is when Paul writes 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, Galatians and 1st and 2nd Corinthians. And around 58 AD is when Paul writes to the Romans. Now, keeping in mind that he never been there yet. He traveled north from Jerusalem to Antioch, around Cilicia, Galatia, Asia, Macedonia, and Greece, and multiple islands. But Paul had never been to Italy or Rome. He's writing this letter to the assemblies in Rome almost 20 years after being added to the body of Christ in Acts chapter 9. 20 years have gone by. Now, why is this important? Why is all this important, you might be wondering? Well, it's important because what Paul is writing in the book of Romans is all about his experience during the past 20 odd years, even talking about Israel's history going back into the Old Testament. And Paul's dream, one of his dreams, his passion, is to one day eventually go to Spain. And his plan is stopped, is to stop by Rome on the way to Spain. Now it seems, however, that God didn't suffice Paul to ever make it to Spain because Paul gets in prison twice in Rome. He ends up being martyred also in the same place. Now the way Paul gets to Rome actually is by being arrested in Jerusalem. Some time goes by and Paul is shipped up to Rome to stand before the Roman authorities to have his fate determined. It's interesting, there's a similarity between Jesus and Paul here. They were both accused by the Jews and the Jews had them both killed by forcing the Romans to kill them. The Jews hated both of them and they used the Gentiles to do their dirty work, if you will. We know the next books that Paul writes after Romans is when he's in prison in Rome. His prison letters or the prison uh, epistles. He writes Philemon, Philippians, Ephesians, and Colossians. Those four books when he's in prison. And then when he's released from prison, he writes 1 Timothy and Titus and then 2 Timothy. And that's all of his books right there. All 13 of them. Then he's martyred right around 66 AD, shortly before the destruction of the temple in 70, 71 AD. Paul's ministry lasted over 30 plus years and I'm not sure if you realize this or not but Paul's ministry for the most part can be seen in the book of Acts. In Acts we see the fall of the kingdom gospel and the creation of the mystery gospel. In chapter 
1 verse 7 we see who Paul's addressing here in Romans 1 7 he says to all that be in Rome beloved of God called to be saints grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ so Paul's addressing the believers in Rome if you look at through Romans chapter 1 we're gonna do a quick synopsis of Romans if you will leading so we can get the context in Romans chapter 1 we see a greeting to the Romans and we see Paul his desire to visit Rome and he mentions and he talks about the just living by faith he talks about God's wrath on the unrighteous and in Romans 2 he talks about God's righteous judgment he also talks about the Jews being guilty just as the Gentiles are guilty and he also mentions that circumcision is useless it, there's no purpose for it as far as salvation is concerned Romans chapter 3 we see God's judgment defended Paul uh, defends God's right to judge because all have sinned everyone is guilty God's righteousness is through faith alone without the law and boasting is excluded in chapter 4 Paul talks about Abraham justed by faith alone and David celebrating this, that same truth in Abraham being justified before being circumcised. And Paul talks about the promise that's granted through faith alone without works. In Romans chapter 5, he talks about faith triumphing in trouble. And Christ uh, taking our place on the cross, redeeming us from our sins, imputing our sins to himself on the cross. And Paul talks about the death in Adam and life in Christ. Chapter uh, Romans chapter 6, he talks about that we are dead to sin and we are alive to God. Uh, we went from slaves of sin to being slaves of God. In Romans 7, Paul mentions that we're freed from the law, that sins, uh, the advantage in the law over concerning sins, that the law cannot cover our sin debt that it is by faith alone that covers our sin debt through Jesus Christ and the finished cross work. He also mentions that law obviously cannot save us. In Romans, again in chapter 7, he mentions that we are released from the law and we are bound to Christ and he talks about the law and sin. Romans chapter 8, he talks about free from indwelling sin, the sonship through the Spirit, from suffering to glory, and God's everlasting love. Now in chapter in Romans chapter 9, Paul talks about Israel's rejection of Christ, Israel's rejection of God's purpose, Israel's rejection and God's justice, and he talks about the present condition of Israel. In chapter 10, he talks about Israel's need of the gospel, Israel's rejection of the gospel. In Romans 11, he mentions and he talks about Israel's rejection is not total and Israel's rejection is not final they can do something about it so in chapters 5 through 8 Paul argues that believers can be assured of their hope and salvation having been freed from the bondage of sin and in chapters 9 through 11 Paul addresses the faithfulness of God to the Israelites where he says that God has been faithful to his promise and Paul hopes that the Israelites will come to realize the truth in chapter 9 since he himself was also an Israelite and he had you know in the past been a persecutor of the way or uh, the little flock Peter and the Apostles and those that they uh, that believed under Peter and the Apostles are called the little flock of Jews right they were all Jews and they became known as the Christians in Antioch we're gonna get into that in a little bit so Peter's group of early Christians if you will now again in Romans 9 through 11 Paul talks about how the nation of Israel has been cast away and the conditions under which Israel will be God's chosen nation once again when when they return to their faith and they set aside their unbelief so note here Paul is speaking to the body of Christ at Rome we went over that Paul is speaking to the body of Christ he's speaking to all right the body of Christ at Rome in chapters 9 10 and 11 he's still speaking to the body of Christ and of course there were others that probably read and heard Paul's letters 
being, you know, through association, but he's speaking about the nation of Israel, the Jews, Israel's history, how they were justified in the Lord in the past, right? So the important thing here to understand is that Paul's talking about Israel and he's speaking to the body of Christ in Rome. In Romans 9, notice chapter 9, he talks about Israel's rejection of Christ, Israel's rejection and God's purpose, Israel's rejection and God's justice, and the present condition of Israel. In chapter 10, Israel needs the gospel. He speaks and he, tell, he tells them that Israel's salvation uh, concerning the day of the Lord. And he mentions Israel's rejection of the gospel. In Romans 11, it's Israel's rejection is not total. Israel's rejection is not final. So Paul, throughout Paul's early ministry, Paul first had to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah written about by the prophets. That was the first step. And after those Jews believed in Jesus, that he was the Messiah, then Paul moved on to step number two, the gospel of grace. Then he explains the meaning of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the complete gospel we see in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. And then we see the Jews completely reject Paul and the gospel. Then his priority is turned to the Gentiles. Now, why was it more difficult for Paul to convince the Jews than it was the Gentiles? We see that in Romans 11, verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Now, whenever we study God's word, we need to get the context, right? And usually the best way to do that is to read the chapter prior to what we're trying to understand. And that's what we need to do here in, in this situation. So we're going to look at Romans chapter 9 verse 1 I say the truth in Christ I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren my kinsmen according to the flesh notice who Paul is speaking about here who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. You see, Paul's trying to get the Jews to see that they're committing a huge mistake by trying to find righteousness through the law alone. That was their downfall. And we see this in the following as well. In verse 30, What shall we say then that the Gentiles which follow not after righteousness have attained righteousness, even righteousness which is of faith? But Israel which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness? Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. In verse 32, we see why Israel fell. They're so focused on the laws that they missed the Messiah. They were blinded by their works, and the stumbling stone is Jesus. Salvation by faith alone without works. They just couldn't get it, right? As so many people today, even today, still don't get it, and they try to work their way into heaven by good works and following the laws, the blindness continues even after 2,000 years. The stumbling stone spoken about in Romans 9.33 is from Isaiah 14. Paul is quoting the Old Testament. Can you see how Paul's recalling of the Old Testament scripture here while he's speaking to the Jews is extremely important in Romans 9, 10, and 11, because he continues, he, he does that all throughout those three chapters, right? In Isaiah 8, 14. Let's look at where he's getting this from. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. 
And Peter also mentions Isaiah in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 2.8, And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now, we get into our main passage of this study, Romans 10, verse 1. Notice who Paul is speaking about here. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. You see, they had a zeal, but their zeal was in the laws, right? They had a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, you see, their own righteousness is works, doing their own thing, trying to make themselves righteous by earning their way into heaven instead of just believing have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth for Moses describeth you see Paul's talking about the Old Testament he's bringing the Israelites their their remembrance he's he's talking to all in Rome but he's talking about Israel and he's reminding them of where they came from in verse 5 for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law that the man which doeth those things shall live by them but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring Christ down from above or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring Christ again from the dead but what saith it? These four words are extremely important whenever you're reading the Bible. But what saith it is your cue. It is an indication that Paul is taught, or anyone who writes this, whether it be Paul, Peter, or the others, whenever they say, but what saith it, they're saying, what does the scripture say about this? And they're pointing back to the Old Testament scriptures, right? They're pointing back to what's been said before. So when you see, but what saith it, that is an indication. It's a clue that he's, whoever's speaking is about to recite scriptures from the Old Testament. So in verse 8 again, but what saith it includes the four gospels. Also, keep in mind, the four gospels were part of this uh, dispensation of the kingdom. So we consider that a continuation from the Old Testament before Paul and the revealing of the mystery okay the word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart that is the word of faith which we preach verse 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation so what scriptures is Paul talking about here? I just told you there's four words that are extremely important, but what saith it, right? We go back to verse 8, but what saith it? Four words. Paul is saying, what do, you know, keep in memory what the old scriptures are saying. Uh, I'm going to point you back to an Old Testament scripture, so pay attention. So, Paul is pointing them back to what Isaiah said in uh, chapter 59, in verse 18. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. So shall he, wait, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun when the enemy shall come in like a flood the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him and the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob saith the Lord as for me this is my covenant with them saith the Lord my spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, 
from henceforth and forever. Also in Deuteronomy 30, verse 10, If thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, and if thou turn unto the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, for this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it? Now pay attention, verse 14. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. Okay, Romans 10, verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now keep in mind, in Romans 10, Paul is still quoting Old Testament scriptures here. Our focus now is on the word saved, okay? Let's look at the word saved. When we hear the word saved today, we tend to think about our salvation in the body of Christ. However, the word saved is used 104 times from Genesis to Revelation. And obviously, the word saved cannot be talking about us today in books outside of Paul's 13 books. The word saved can mean many different things in God's word. And that's where studying to show ourselves approved really pays off. Look at Acts chapter 2 verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This word saved is the Greek word sozo. Now we know by rightly dividing that Acts chapter 2 comes long before Paul's conversion. A long time before the revealing of the mystery of the gospel of grace. So the word saved here, sozo, it happens to be G4982, if you want to look it up in Strong's. It means endure till the end, okay? Those will be delivered and rescued. We see the same word, sozo, in Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, sozo. Again, we know Matthew 24 is talking about the day of the Lord. This is a long time before Paul and the revealing of the gospel of grace again. Now, if you haven't studied the parables of the virgins, the dragnet, the two in the field, and so on, I encourage you to do so. It is going to help you understand the day of the Lord much better. So, we see this word saved used outside of Paul's books. So, it can't be talking about our salvation in the body of Christ. And I just mentioned two examples. One in Acts chapter 2 and another in Matthew 24. So let's look at Acts chapter 2 real quick again in verse 13. Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem. Who's he talking to here? The Jews. Be this known unto you, the Jews, Israel, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it, but it is the third hour of the day. It was 9 a.m. in the morning. But this is that which was spoken of by, by the prophet Joel. He's telling you right there, this is something that was written by Joel the prophet in the Old Testament. Look at verse 17. What did Joel say? And it shall come to pass in when the last days. This is during the day of the Lord, Daniel's 70th week. Saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Look at verse 21. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So where in the Old Testament is Peter and Paul taking this phrase, call on the name of the Lord passage? Well, it's found, uh, well, it's important to pay attention to the timing of, of what Joel is talking about here as well. 
This concerns, like I said, the day of the Lord. Let's look at Joel 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. So we know what period of time we're dealing with here. Verse 2. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Verse 3, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as a garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses and horsemen, so shall they run. Now let me tell you about these horses. Whenever you see horses in the Bible, it's a reference to combat or war, okay? Just like the angels returning at the second coming, riding on white horses. If you look up the word horses uh, and translate it back to the Greek, you're going to find out that whenever the word horse is used as a reference, it means combat and war. So when we see the angels coming back with Christ at the second coming, they're on white horses. It's a reference that they are prepared for battle. And we know the rest of the story that they are indeed prepared for battle. Let's look at verse 6. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. And they shall march uh, everyone on his ways and they shall not break their ranks neither shall one thrust another they shall walk everyone in his path and when they fall upon the sword they shall not be wounded so what we've been reading so far tells us that Joel's prophesying about the day of the Lord here Daniel's 70th week into the 1000 year millennium continuing on in verse 30 and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood fire and pillars of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Notice how familiar this phrase is because Peter said it in the book of Acts and Paul quoted it as well. Okay, this is something and understand that Paul was talking to the Jews in Romans. He's, he wrote the letter to all in Rome, but he's in, in chapter 10, he's speaking about the nation of Israel. He's addressing them and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered notice Joel uses the word delivered that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered it's the same root word again being used sozo so when you read it in Acts and in the New Testament if you will and they use the word saved it's important to understand that the root word sozo doesn't mean salvation as in today salvation for the body of Christ it means something else it is being delivered well what are they going to be delivered from at the end of Daniel 70th week when Christ comes he delivers the believers and he separates the believers amongst them the unbelievers right so in essence they are saved but he's not talking about a soul uh, body of Christ type of salvation it's a different word altogether so in verse 32 again, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So we get a more clear context here by reading Joel's prophecy. Here we see the word delivered, which is exactly what the context of the word saved means in Acts chapter 2 and in Matthew 24. So pay attention to the rest of this passage here. Paul tells them, the order of events concerning salvation first that they have to believe in Jesus then they have to hear the gospel death burial resurrection and so on now keep in mind before anything a person has to realize that they're first lost in sin right and they need to be saved from God's wrath this is what repentance is all about turning from something and turning towards something else a change in attitude a change in thought in order to be saved First, you have to realize that you need to be saved and you need to know what you're being saved from. Otherwise, you're going to be believing in vain. Okay, continuing on Romans 10 verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? See, Paul's explaining that the other half, once they believe in Jesus, 
then they have to believe in the gospel of grace, right? And Paul's mentioning this in, in verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings to good things. Verse 16, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah said, is, I, but Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands into a disobedient and gainsaying people. Now, have you ever wondered why people just, why people just love to confuse the simple things in God's word? Why would people choose to ignore what Paul says is for us today completely ignoring the gospel today and place themselves under a different gospel why do they do that well why would anyone want to do that could it be because they're trying to work their way or trying to earn their way into heaven well that could be Paul tells us plainly and simply what the gospel is for us today so simple that a child can understand it there's nothing complicating about Paul's message which is to and for us today so why change it Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood. This is speaking to us today. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now, do you know what verse 14 means? the word earnest. Do you know what earnest means? It is a down payment. It is our seal. The Holy Spirit is our down payment and our seal of our inheritance. Once you're sealed, you're sealed until forever. Okay? You can never be unsealed, but you must first be sealed, right? You're sealed with the down payment of the Holy Spirit. As soon as you believe, as soon as you realize that you're a sinner and you need to be saved from God's wrath first you need to realize that there you need to be saved from something right that has to be your first step so you realize that you need to be saved from God's wrath you realize that you're lost in sin and when as soon as you believe who Jesus Christ is and was and what he did the death burial resurrection the gospel when you understand the gospel and you believe it sincerely you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's the faith of Christ Jesus that keeps you sealed forever. Okay? Jesus cannot deny himself, saints. It's his faith that keeps you sealed for eternity. That's why you can't lose salvation. In order for you to lose your salvation, Jesus would have to be unfaithful to what he did on the cross. He would have to lose 
his convictions. He would have to lose his own faith and he would have to lose his trust in himself of what the cross work means. So his faith keeps you sealed. Okay? In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And the reason why, when you see this, if ye keep in memory that I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Paul was discussing uh, the situation where there was a group of people that did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Okay? And this is what Paul is addressing here when he, in this verse. Um, he's saying, you believed everything else uh, as far as, you know, the gospel. You, you believed everything that you needed to believe about who Jesus is, what he did, but you didn't believe in the resurrection. And that's what Paul's saying, unless ye have believed in vain. He's speaking to those that perhaps did not believe in the resurrection, but believed everything else, okay? For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he's going to remind him here about the resurrection and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And that he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve. After that, he was seen above five hundred uh, brethren at once and whom the greater part remain unto this day, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. And in Galatians 3, verse 6, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Now, when you read Paul's gospel for today, and then you, and then you read Romans 9, 10, and 11, you can't help but notice that there's a, there's a difference going on. There's a contradiction. And that's because Paul is speaking about Israel in time past. He's quoting Joel in chapter 2, way before the mystery of the gospel of grace was even shown to Paul before the creation of the body of Christ. He's talking about the same confession Jesus required during his earthly ministry to Israel in the kingdom program. In fact, we've seen in chapter 9, in Romans 9, that Paul's speaking to the same people that Jesus was, his kinsmen in the flesh, Israel, in the kingdom program, or the dispensation of the coming earthly kingdom promised to the seed of Jacob, the 12 tribes of Israel. It's in these three chapters of Romans 9, 10, and 11 that Paul explains the dispensational fall of the nation of Israel, the collapse of the law, kingdom, gospel. Chapter 10, he's explaining why and how Israel dropped the ball and what they needed to do to be accepted and justified in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. His answer is that they should confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Just like Peter did in Matthew 16. Confess is to believe that Jesus was the Messiah prophesied about in the Old Testament. And believe that God raised him from the dead just like the disciples learned in John chapter 20. And we know because we rightly divide that Matthew and John are both during the kingdom gospel. If you study, if you study Romans 10, you'll notice something's missing in Israel's message. Something Paul is not mentioning something here in this passage. And what's missing, what he's not mentioning, is the mystery gospel of grace revealed to him. The death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel for today is not seen in Romans 10. And now we know why. The problem with denominational churches today is that they, they want to throw you into a works program. Okay, They want you to work your way into salvation. 
They teach you that you have to do something or keep doing something to keep your salvation. When in fact, Paul tells us that all is required is to hear and believe the gospel, which includes why we need salvation in the first place, because of sin, and because we're lost in sin, we need to be saved from God's wrath that deals with you know all of that sin. And then Paul explains the way that we're saved from God's wrath is through belief on Christ Jesus and his finished work on the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection. It doesn't take a genius to figure out all it takes is some study, right division, to see that Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 was a formula for the lost Jews to be saved from Israel's apostasy during the Acts period. Paul wrote it with the Jewish salvation in mind, the little flock, the same gospel that Jesus was preaching when he walked the earth with Peter and the others. Okay, he's speaking, the, this is all about the Jewish salvation. Keep that in mind. And this is during the transitional period. He did it to provoke lost Israel into understanding their spiritual collapse. Okay? Romans 10 has nothing to do with us Gentiles or the members of the body of Christ today. And it doesn't matter what your denomination teaches. What matters is what God's word actually says. There's only one way to heaven, folks. And I promise you, it's not found in the traditions of men. That's a fact. That's why 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 should be used instead of Romans 10. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised again the third day. That's the gospel of grace written to and for us today in the dispensation of grace. Unfortunately, Romans 10 is also used to pressure new Christians to get up before the congregation to make a profession of faith. Lest they, you know, or else they're not going to complete their salvation. Again, this comes from twisting God's word. They're using Romans 10, which is written about Israel's past and trying to place it, place these people today in their program. You can't do that. That's the opposite of right division. Matthew 10 also is abused. When they say, come, walk the aisle, shake the preacher's hand and make your profession of faith in Jesus. You know, Matthew 10 is all about the Jews and the kingdom gospel. It's not about today at all. In 2 Corinthians 4, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, here, this is written to us here, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. 2 Corinthians 11, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtly, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Second Timothy 2.24 And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Why anyone would want to complicate such a simple gospel is beyond me. Personally, I was so tired, just like a lot of you, of being confused by religions and denominations and traditions. And it's when I said enough is enough and I started rightly dividing, that's when I found peace and comfort. That's when my eyes were opened. That's when I started understanding God's word. And I pray that you're going to do the same. So you see, preachers who are teaching people that all they have to do is call on the name of Jesus to be saved without knowing, trusting, and believing on who Jesus is, why he died, and what his resurrection does for us, are those same people in Matthew chapter 7. 721. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. 
Many will say to me in that day, what day? The day of the Lord, at the second coming, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These people are those who are going to wait till the very last second of Daniel's 70th week to call on Jesus, and it won't do anything. And honestly, they're not even going to make it that far because they're going to be deceived by the Antichrist way before that happens. And if they do by some miracle make it to the end of Daniel's 70th week, they're going to be just like the foolish virgin's parable who have no works or proof of their faith. And they're going to be rejected when the Lord says, Depart from me, I never knew you. A smart person today won't be that person in Matthew 7. 2,000 years of grace... God has given us 2,000 years to get it right. That's a lot of grace, folks. All we need to do is believe what God tells us in His Word. And we need to rightly divide His Word to understand it. It's a very, very dangerous thing to put your soul in the hands of another man. Trusting that man to make sure your soul goes to heaven. Trust God's Word only, folks. Not man's traditions or denominations. Don't fall in love with a religion. Fall in love with God. One of the biggest mistakes I see people doing today is worshiping their pastor. For some people, their pastor can do no wrong. Their pastor is flawless. They've made their pastor their master. That's the number one problem in Christendom today. People just don't want to take the time to open their Bible and study it for themselves. Instead, they'd rather sit in church on Sunday and let someone else spoon feed them stuff that's not even in the Bible. If you don't take the time to confirm and reconfirm what your pastor is telling you, if you don't take the time to make sure that everything your pastor is telling you is actually in God's word, then you're placing your soul in the hands of your pastor. And that, my friend, is the most dangerous and irresponsible thing you can do. And that's something to think about. Thanks for studying with me, saints. Lord willing, I'll see you on the next study. Ooh.